2001 and continues to freelance on movies and television, including the 2009 Disney movie Secretariat and the made-for-TV movie Ruffian. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming William Knack. Thank you. Thank you very much. Boy, I think I'll do that again. That's great. Um, on the afternoon of uh, August 25th, 1972, as I was sitting in the old wooden press box at Sar Saratoga Racecourse, I turned to a veteran race tracker sitting next to me, a look-alike, a Burl Ives look-alike, named Arthur Kennedy, and I introduced myself. Now, this was my first week covering any kind of a horse race at Saratoga. I was a new turf rider at Newsday, and it was an absolutely perfect day. The sun was up and doing business above the elms. The flags were snapping at attention in the infield. The old canoe was bobbing on the lake. And right out there on the racetrack, nine colts were parading to the post for the hopeful stakes. The premier race for two-year-olds at the spa, an historic an event that had been won by many of the greatest racehorses in history. And right there in front of me, his golden coat dappled in the sun was the strapping muscular dude named Secretariat. He had come to the spot to demonstrate for all the world what he was about. In fact, as things turned out to demonstrate what horse racing had always been about at Saratoga. Caught up in this rather idyllic scene, something for me akin to heaven on earth, I turned to Arthur and I said something like, would you believe that six months ago I was running around Long Island investigating the effects of laundry detergent seeping into groundwater <laughs> and learning all one ever needed to know about tertiary treatment of raw sewage? Startled, the gentlemanly Arthur looked at me and said, welcome to Saratoga. You escaped just in time. I said, in time for what? He said, to see Secretariat win the hopeful. I've been around racetracks a long time, Arthur said, and I saw him win the Sanford up there. He's a man among boys. I had already seen the cold break as maiden down below, as we referred to Long Island up here. But I had read about the Sanford and had talked to trainer P.G. Johnson about it. He had raved about how Secretariat had pulverized the Sanford field especially his disrobing of a very fast colt named Linda's Chief. My arrival there in that press box overlooking this Eden of the Adirondacks was of a sequence touched by magic. More than 60 years ago, back in the mid-1950s, when I was a larval horse fancier and horseback riding instructor living in a northern outskirt of Chicago, I was taken by a neighbor one day to Washington Park racetrack some 30 miles south of the loop. It was late August of 1955. As I stood at the rail near the tunnel leading from the paddock, the public address announcer told the throng of 40,000 souls that the great racehorse Swaps, that year's winner of the Kentucky Derby, just off his record-smashing performance in the American Derby, was about to parade on the track for the pleasure of the crowds. Moments later, there he was, striding along the outer rail with tiny Bill Shoemaker on his back. He was a lovely racehorse with a head that had a kind of cameo quality to it. And as the shoe walked in past the crowds, we kids all hollered to him to bring him over. Bring him over here, Bill, which he did. He very quietly brought the horse over to the outer rail. The swaps dropped his head over it. Instinctively, I reached up my right arm, palm down. He stuck out his nose tentatively and then dropped it, smelling the back of my hand. I can still feel that warm breath yet today. And I would suggest if anybody uh, does not want to commit about 45 years to the racetrack, do not allow a thoroughbred horse to breathe on the back of your hand. <laughs> his warm breath went through me like a current, something eerily divine. And from that moment on, that horse and the game of racing itself owned me as no other. 
The effect that passing moment had on me was genuinely stupendous. It made me a student of the game's colorful past, a witness to its grandest traditions, and ultimately a steady habitué of its far-flung gambling hills from Newmarket to Longchamp, from Santa Anita to Hialeah to Saratoga. I began reading everything I could about the Colts' upcoming match race at Washington Park against Nashua, who was training for the race right here at Saratoga. The daily press was filled with stories not only about the race, but about Saratoga itself, the spa, and how Sonny Jim Fitzsimmons, Nashua's trainer, would sit for hours at the end of his shed and spin tales about his charges and past racing, regaling newspaper men about his two Triple Crown winners, Gallon Fox at Omaha, and his Derby winner, Johnstown, 1939, the sire, by the way, of Nashua's dam, a mare named Segula. My total immersion in Saratoga lore led to an amusing colloquy with my father. Don't forget, I was 14. Saratoga's in New York, isn't it? I asked him one morning. He nodded, yes, it's somewhere upstate. I said, hmm, why is Nashua stabled in New York and training in Oklahoma? Uh, he said, I don't know, you better look into that. Well, further investigation revealed that Oklahoma was the fabled training track across Union Avenue, and rumors were flying that Nashua, over that deep and tiring surface, had blazed five-eighths of a mile in 56 seconds as a final prep for what would turn out to be a sweeping six-and-a-half-length victory over a sore-footed swaps in a match race I would just as soon forget. That lamentable outcome for me aside, thus and there began my nearly endless fascination for for Saratoga, an enduring passion to understand its mural length history, its abundant legends, and its lore. Two years later, I gave up my life as a rider of saddle horses and became a regular at Arlington Park. I even became a groom and a hot walker. Two or three times a week in August, my father would dispatch me to the newsstand in Evanston to buy the daily racing form for 35 cents. I repeat, for 35 cents. <laughs> Unable to wait till I got home, I would sit in that old DeSoto under the dim orange light of the street lamp hanging by the elevated tracks, and I would devour morsel by tender morsel all I could find out about Saratoga and try to imagine what it looked like at first light, from the backstretch kitchens to the wooden sheds to Sonny Jim's place next, next to Oklahoma. Saratoga even followed me to Vietnam in 1967 when I was a soldier in the army there. My mother used to send me audio tapes of the races she'd recorded off the television, and I'd sit alone in my billet at night listening to them. One was of announcer Fred Capicella's call of the Travers that year, 1967, when Damascus looked like Pegasus himself, winning the Travers by 22 hysterical lengths. I left Saigon in a hurry during the Tet Offensive in March of 68, and in my haste, I left my tapes and tape recorder under that cot. But over the years, it pleasured me no end to imagine some Viet Cong colonel finding my recorder and listening to Fred Capicella's call of Damascus winning the Travers by, one, by 22 and wondering who Damascus was and what to make of this all. Four years later, after a year spent reporting and writing a three-part Newsday series on sewers and freshwater resources on Long Island, I was attending a Christmas party in, Suffolk, in the Suffolk office of the newspaper when, at the urging of my colleagues who knew of my passion for the races, got me to mount the desk in the middle of the city room and recite from memory all of the Kentucky Derby winners from 1875 to the then present. Aristides, Vagrant, Baden, Baden, Daystar, Lord Murphy, Fonzo, Hindu, Apollo, Leonidas, Buchanan, Joe Cotton, Ben Ali, Montrose, McPhess, Spokane, Riley, King Manasseh, Little Rock, Chan, Helm, and Ben Brush, Typhoon, the second brought it, Emmanuel, and Lieutenant Gibson. That is the 19th century. I will not belabor you with the 20th. <laughs> I dismounted from the table, and uh, at once the Newsday editor, David Laventhal, sidled up next to me and asked why I knew that. And I said, well, David, I thought everybody knew that. That's very good. What school did you go to? 
Uh, and he said, no, seriously. I said, no, I, I've been studying it since I was a kid. I love horse racing. I love the history, the lore, the color. I like touching them. I like their faces. I like the way they breathe on the back of my hand. And he said, uh, you're not happy covering sewers and stuff on Long Island. I, I said, David, I said, there are days I'd rather be having a root canal. And he said, well, he said, uh, would you like to cover horse racing for us? And I said, I beg your pardon? He said, would you like to cover racing for us? We're going to a seven day a week paper this coming April, 72. We didn't have a Sunday paper. We were going to have a Sunday paper, a broadsheet, and we need a turf writer. And you'd be perfect for it. And so five minutes later, I had totally turned my career from writing about environment and politics, and I became a turf writer. And he said, by the way, Billy said, uh, you have the job, but I want you to write me a note, a memo asking me for it, and I'll post it. And that way, um, uh, I won't have a lot of editors and people coming in here wondering whether I've gone insane or you have. So just write me a nice note about why you want to cover horse racing. And the only thing I remember about that memo to David was, uh, was when I told him that after three and a half years of covering politicians, I would like the chance to cover the whole horse. And so, uh, yeah. next, thing I, next thing I knew, it was June of 1972. I'd been a turf writer for three months, and uh, I was with the Red Smith, the great Red Smith, the great writer, and the sports writer from the Herald Tribune in the press box. And uh, he was from the New York Times, actually, by that time. But he said, uh, I, he was, I said to him, Red, I'm going to Saratoga this year to cover the races. He says, oh, great. He said, you'll love it up there. He says, you know how to get there? And I says, yeah, it's somewhere up north, near Montreal, right? He said, he said, I'll tell you how to get there. He said, you drive north on the thruway for 175 miles, turn off at exit 14, take Union Avenue west, and go back about 100 years. I said, perfect. Best directions I've ever had for anything. Well, you know what? I found out over the years that that is really Saratoga's charm. By then, I had immersed myself in Saratoga's history and its distinctive culture, especially as that culture and that history was embroidered by Red's dear friend, turf writer extraordinaire Joe Palmer of the old New York Tribune, who wrote years ago, and I'd like to read something that Joe wrote about Saratoga. Saratoga represents a reaffirmation of racing as enjoyment, of the original forces which first called it into being. It is a successful turning back of the pages, a stroll through the mirror, the slow drop of Alice down the rabbit hole. It is a month of living in about 1910. It is a gathering of the clan. Nowhere, not even in Lexington, is there such a concentration of owners, trainers, jockeys, touts, officials, and racetrack presidents in so limited an area. But Saratoga does not depend on the racing of the afternoons or the gaiety of the evenings for its magic. For these can be found elsewhere. Some of the credit must go to the town itself. It is a town of big, quiet houses, of deep, perfectly trimmed lawns, and of clear, lucent mornings with the sunshine lying on the elm trees like bright dust. Tradition sits gracefully on Saratoga because it is a graceful, irresponsible, gay tradition, and its ghosts are pleasant ghosts. A man who would change it would stir champagne. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? Note the whole history of Saratoga stirred the champagne with the vigor of John Morrissey. He waved that temporary wand that got the whole thing started. Morrissey was an Irish-born roughneck from Troy, New York, who rose in the mid-19th century to become the preeminent gambling impresario of Saratoga Springs, the founder of thriving casinos and the money behind the construction of the first racetrack. This, after working his way up, as a rabble-rouser supreme, a street urchin, a cargo thief, a debt collector for Irish mob bosses, a fearless poker player at the Bull's Head Tavern, the leader of a New York street gang called the Dead Rabbits, a ward healer, a deckhand on a riverboat, a ballot stuffer, and the bouncer in a South Troy saloon and whorehouse where, 
when he wasn't heaving drunken sailors out the front door, was teaching himself to read and write. Skills that served him well during his two terms as a U.S. congressman at Tammany Hall and later a state senator from New York. And oh yes, let us not forget that John Morrissey was also behind, behind those bare knuckles and leonine courage, the reigning heavyweight champion of the world after beating Yankee Sullivan, a pug-nosed fugitive from the Australian penal colony of Botany Bay, following 37 rounds of blood, mayhem, and prayers in 1853. What a guy. John retired from boxing in 1859, and four years later, he presided at the opening of Saratoga Racetrack, August of 63, and watched a mare named Lizzie W. win the opening event barely a month after General Pickett made his fateful charge across that open field at Gettysburg. So, thanks to the dark-eyed John Morrissey, to that chestnut who breathed on the back of my hand, and to that far-off night of revelry at the Newsday Christmas party, yellowing now in memory, to them I owe the obvious blessing of sitting in that press box next to Art Kennedy in 72. Ever since the grand families ran racing in America, since the Whitneys and Vanderbilts, the Mellons and Woodwards, the Chenneries and Bancrofts and Phippses made Saratoga their summer playground, the nine furlong oval at the spa, the oldest in America, was the place where they all came together every August to show off their finest two-year-olds, their best fillies and their best colts, sired by their best stallions and out of their most blue-blooded mirrors. Hosting races like the Saratoga Special, the Sanford and Hopeful for colts, and the Adirondack, the Schuylerville, and Spinaway for fillies, Saratoga was not so much a vast betting parlor as it was the fanciest equine kindergarten on the planet. With these wealthy families grooming their children, equine children, to see who had the fastest kid on North Broadway. And not incidentally, to see whose, stallion were, whose stallions were hot and whose stallions were not. It had been that way ever since Hall of Famer Hamburg won two stakes there in 1897. In 1913, Old Rosebud crowned one of the greatest two-year-old campaigns in history with two stakes victories at Saratoga, and in his second start the following year, he smashed the Kentucky Derby field, winning by eight lengths and setting a new track record that stood for 17 years. People say, who's Old Rosebud? Well, Charlie Hatton, the great turf writer from the Daily Racing Forum and great turf historian, once said to me something I shall never forget. He said, uh, there was nothing like, there's nothing like watching old Rosebud cut up a field of horses. It was like watching an artist at work. And the late great trainer, Ben Jones of the Calumet Farm, uh, Hall of Famer, the man that Joe Hirsch regarded as the greatest of all trainers, whenever a new phenom, equine phenom, burst on the racing scene, uh, Somebody would say to Ben, what do you think of so-and-so? And he had always had a four-word stock reply, couldn't beat old Rosebud. That's who he was. And he really made his career here at Saratoga as a baby. Um, that same year, 1914, that he won the Derby, the year in the month that the world shook, by the way, with the guns of August, the beginning of World War I, Harry Payne Whitney's great Hall of Fame filly, Regret, won three major juvenile stakes at Saratoga, all against males, and culminating with a triumph in the hopeful. Her only three starts as a baby. And in her fourth lifetime start, in May of 1915, as though still carried by the momentum of her three victories at Saratoga, Regret became the first filly in history to win the Kentucky Derby. Over 15 of the first 40 horses inducted into the Racing Hall of Fame won as juveniles at Saratoga, including the immortal Man of War and three Triple Crown winners, Sir Barton, Gallon Fox, and Whirl Away. So no wonder that Saratoga paddock, shaded by those stately elms, was buzzing and crawling with breeders and owners in summer suits and dresses when Secretariat, bred and owned by a paragon of the Jockey Club establishment, Christopher T. Chenery, came strolling in for the hopeful. Supple of muscle and golden of coat, 
He looked like a great discus thrower. The atmosphere he generated was electric. Aging, the Charles Hatton again, was already calling him the finest physical specimen he'd ever seen in 55 years on the racetrack. The hopeful was where Secretary announced emphatically in the long-established tradition of Saratoga who he was and how fast he would get there. I have to apologize for the nature of the video I want to show you of the hopeful. Uh, there is no sound. But he is last going down the back stretch. He's number seven. And from the half-mile pole going into the far turn, he makes a run of 290 yards in which he's running that quarter mile in about 21 and three-fifths seconds, which is as fast as horses can run, and he was just a baby. Um, and so if you could uh, uh, show the, uh, the, the uh, hopeful of 72, he goes from last to first in 290 yards, number seven. Suddenly he asked him to run, there he is. Now he goes, he's passing one horse, disappearing behind another. Now he's, he's on the outside, he's going by a flight of three, appears, now he's, on, now he's fourth, now he's heading for third, and he hasn't even turned for home yet. And now he's home, and he's on the lead right now on the outside. It was one of the most astonishing runs. Now he's coming through the stretch, and uh, he's got... Uh, well, probably 360s of a mile to go here, and he simply pulls away. This was no contest. And uh, Bill Johnson told me it was one of the greatest performances he's ever seen by a two-year-old. And he, at the end of this race, I was in the I was in the box seat section. After this race, there were breeders running around saying, "My God, he was my bull ruler out of a Prince Polo mare. He was bred absolutely in the purple, best bred horse at all Saratoga." And in the United States, maybe the world. And here he's running like this. My God, this was a breeder's dream come true. I know Taylor Harden came up to Penny Tweedy and said, Mrs. Tweedy, when you put this horse out to stud, I'd love to have a share of it. Uh, Homer, uh, 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 Jones, uh, I forgot his first name. Anyway, he came up to her and said something. Alfred Vanderbilt, uh, who was sitting in the box seat right in front of Penny, said, Penny, if you're interested in ever selling this horse, I'd love to have a piece of him for breeding purposes. And so it was really tremendously exciting. Um, anyway, so there I was in my first week of covering horse racing in Saratoga, and I'd seen the best two-year-old colt ever. Now, two years later in June, I was sitting at home in Huntington finishing my book on Secretariat when a Newsday colleague named John Preachy called me up on the phone and said, they had seen a two-year-old filly that very day like no other. She had just won her first start by 15 lengths and in the process tied the track record, unheard of. For a maiden, unraced two-year-old filly to win by 15 and tie a track record set by a colt back years and years before, her name was Ruffian. John told me, she's unbelievable. You've got to see this filly. She's a freak. Freak is a very, uh, is a, by the way, a very complimentary word used in horse racing. It, it doesn't mean she belongs in a circus. It just means she's so unusual. She's freakishly fast. Um, so I finished my book, and the first thing I did is I went out there, and I saw her blow everything away in her next start. I think it was the fashion at Aqueduct. And she was then and still remains today the fastest two-year-old affiliate I'd ever seen. And uh, in August, she was aiming for the spinaway here at Saratoga. And the big race for two-year-old fillies, it's the counterpart for the Colts. Colts run in the hopeful, fillies run in the, in the uh, spinaway. That's the way it's supposed to be. Well, uh, a friend of mine, Andrew Beyer of the Washington Post and I, we were having dinner one night at a place called the Turf Bar in uh, Saratoga. Uh, and he told me that Ruffian was running speed figures in the, in the 120s. And that's his way of measuring 
quali the quality of a work, the quality of a performance. And, uh, and the 120s are horses win the Derby at 110 and 112 with 115. Secretary ran in the 120s. She was running right away in the 120s, unheard of. And uh, and he said, Byer said that uh, there was a Al, Al Scotty had a very fast trainer. Al Scotty had a very fast filly in the spinaway, uh, aiming for the spinaway named Laughing Bridge. She she was she could flat fly. She had won two stakes up here at Saratoga against fillies, and. Uh, but Andy looked at the PPs and looked at the numbers, and he said, she has got no chance against Ruffian. As good. And so we did something that neither of us had ever done before in our lives. I'd never done it since. Um, uh, but uh, uh, we decided to sit down with Scotty, a horse trainer, the horse trainer, to, to save him from himself. Uh, you're not supposed to do that as a journalist. Um, you're supposed to just let the world unfold as it's supposed to without any influence on it. But of course, I think Andy wanted to make a bet, you know. <laughs> and I thought it was a very good idea because I didn't think she had a chance either. But anyway, we collared Al outside of Kenny No's office. He was the racing secretary. And we urged Al to duck the spin away and run against the weaker bunch of Colts in the hopeful. We took. Al, you've got a wonderful filly. She's very fast, but she has no chance against Ruffian. But you do have a chance to beat the Colts and the Hopeful. He looked at us like we were crazy. He said, duck the Phillies and run against the Colts? That's counterintuitive. Well, Andy said, look, <clears throat> you ever hear Andy Byer talk? He talked real low. Ah, uh, Al. Ah. Uh, Forget that Ruffian is a filly. Try to think of her as a colt. Try to think of her as secretariat. Al yeah, looked at him like, what? She ran as fast as he ran as a two-year-old, which means you have no chance against her. You're much better off with the colts. They're much weaker. Well, we went at Al Scotty that day in relays. Finally, he threw up his arms walked into Kenny and said, I've got to talk to Kenny No about this. So we waited. We sat on that bench by the lemonade machine waiting for him to come out. He finally came, burst through the door, his face wreathed in a smile of relief, and said that Ken No had told him to stay where he was in the spinaway. Quote, Kenny doesn't believe in running two-year-old fillies against Colts, unquote. I jumped up, grabbed Al's hand and said, Al, good luck. You're going to need it. Uh, anyway, I am going to show you uh, what happened in the spinaway when Laughing Bridge ran against Ruffian. Here it is. It actually has sound. Well, it's a good thing. Spin in red. And between horses, Ruffian takes the lead. That is not an inside of second. Laughing Bridge in third position. Some swing it on the midfoot. Down the back stretch, Ruffian has the lead. By one length, Scottish Melody is second a length and a quarter. Laughing Bridge is third by a length and three quarters. And Sun Swinger makes his fourth. They move past the half mile four and now round the far side. Ruffian draws away the lead by two and a half. As Laughing Bridge takes over second position by a length and a quarter. Scottish Melody is third by six lengths. Sun Swinger is fourth as they come to the top of the stretch. Ruffian in command by two lengths. Laughing Bridge now second by three. Scottish Melody third and some swinger. The quartet straightens away in the stretch. Ruffian in front by three and a half lengths. With Laughing Bridge is second. The Scottish Melody on the inside third. And some swinger is fourth. Coming to the 16th pair. Ruffian now draws away the lead by eight. By ten it's Ruffian going easily in front. A magnificent performance as Ruffian eased under the wire by Jockey Vince Bocelli Jr. takes the 83rd running of the spinaway stakes. That was the easiest victory I've seen in some time. Ruffing Bridge was second. There was no show wagering. And wow. She won by 13. And all Vince Bracciali, the jockey, had to do was do that one time, and she'd have broken the track record for six furlongs. 
She is the greatest filly I have ever seen. And uh, after the race, Al Scotty was down at the winner's circle, and he made a safe sign like an umpire at home plate and said to Frank Whiteley, ruffian's trainer, that's it, Frank, no more. I'm not going to I'm not going to run against you ever again. And uh, anyway, it was a wonderful moment. Uh, the place again, like when Secretary won the hopeful. Of course, the breeders weren't running around like crazy because you know, the mare was privately owned, and you can't syndicate a mare. She can only have one foal a year, and uh, unlike a stallion, could sire 75, 100. And but people were just so excited, and uh, it was one of the great days at Saratoga. Um, um, so anyway, you know, Saratoga has always been enormously popular over the years because it, because it has been, in my view, the most pleasurable of all racing destinations, a perfect confluence of glamour and gambling, of, of old money and new, and of history and tradition, featuring memorable characters, both human and equine, all pulled together in a 19th century setting that comes vibrantly alive once a year for our pleasure and recreation, like Brigadoon, under peppermint awnings and oyster shell skies. I used to love to talk to the, old, to the resident old timers about Saratoga, trainers like Holly Hughes and George Major Odom, and ask them about the good old days and what Saratoga was like, just as I had tried to dream it when I was a kid, parked in front of that newsstand in Evanston. I once sat down and I sat down and tried to claw together uh, a, a bit of a prose poem about what, what Saratoga was like um, after talking to these old timers, and it came out sort of like this. Saratoga is the greatest racetrack in America, the place where history breathes through every cornice and spire, where the very sun mounts up in livery and rides on horses slipping from their darkened stalls and heading in sets of seven for the track. You can close your eyes and hear the roosters crowing each to each, and hear the sound of hoofbeats thumping past and the rhythmic breathing of the animals in their timeless circuits of the place. This is the town of parasols and derby hats and tassel surreys with the fringe on top, a racetrack of eggs and bacon frying along the roads of sheds and of horses whinnying in the night. It is where the whole town stopped at the whistle blast of the trains that wheezed into the railroad station nearly every summer going back to the Civil War, and where minutes later, up the dusty main street past the United States and Grand Union hotels, the army of grooms came leading strings of horses to the track across town, their metal heels clicking as they turned up Union Avenue, horses long dead now but whose names today are embedded like dragonflies in the amber of their times. Close your eyes and you can almost see them marching in a file through the center of your town. There is the mighty man of what supple as a lion, an aging exterminator known as Old Bones, and the triple crown winners Sir Barton and Gallon Fox and War Admiral, and later came the Philly top flight and the weight carrier Discovery called the Iron Horse, and came then the Fleet 20 Grand and Cavalcade and C.V. Whitney's equipoise known as the Chocolate Soldier. And behind him down Union Avenue strode the unsung sea biscuit and stretch running Whirlaway, of whom Red Smith once wrote, when Whirlaway turned on the heat, you could almost hear a frying sound. And Sykes Beat and Johnstown and Native Dancer, nicknamed the Grey Ghost, and the brilliant Colin and Masquette, and Peter Pan and Fairplay, the sire of Man of War, and Tom Fool, who had muscles on his eyebrows. The to the spa to entertain the Carolina planters and the New York financiers for whom Saratoga had forever been a retreat and playpen, a place for afternoon tea and scones for Jack Daniels neat. At night for a few days in August, they all congregated at the Phasic Tipton Pavilion and bid on the yearlings offered for sale. Here is where Sam Riddle in 1918 shelled out $5,000 for that bright chestnut that he would name Man of War. A hundred years ago, here is where America's most notorious gambler, John Bedemillion Gates, the barbed wire baron, once lost a staggering $400,000 in one day playing the horses and then returned in what I think might have been the comeback of the decade to win so much money on a single bet that he needed a grocery cart to carry his cash away. And gamblers recall the day in the late 1930s when Art Rooney, 
the founder of the Pittsburgh Steelers, all but swept the card at Saratoga and walked out of that betting ring with $105,000. I know he did, Reggie Halpern, a bookmaker in the 1930s, told me. I took some of his action. And finally, there was Mary Elizabeth Altimus Whitney, once described by Alfred Vanderbilt as the most beautiful woman in America, who used to come to the races at 6 a.m. to see her horses work, still dressed in the evening gown she had worn the night before, and now leading a kennel of her miniature dogs on a dozen sequined leashes. In the late 1920s, Peggy Whitney saw her in the paddock one day at Saratoga, and he told his son, John Hay, Jock Whitney, that's the girl I want you to marry. They met on September 5th, 1830, immediately after the Saratoga meet. They came up here every August and lived in that big white wedding cake of a mansion with columns in front, broad palms all around, and its own private stables and training track. I sat with her once, not long before she died, and she talked of many wonderful memories that she'd had at Saratoga, but she also recalled that her most vivid memory there was freighted with considerable pain. For Saratoga is where she left Jock. Cool. Here she was lying uh, on a hammock up here in Saratoga on a little farm she had near Schuylerville, and I had a pencil and pad in my hand, and I said, well, what was that like? Why did you leave him? She said, Quote, he was too much of a ladies' man for me, she said. It was so stupid. But when you're young and you start crazy about somebody and you see him out with Tolupa Bankhead and all those bums, I couldn't take it anymore. That's all. He brought Loretta Young to the house one weekend here. Loretta Young. But Tolupa was the worst. And I just got tired of it. That's when I decided Reno was the place for me. Now, I want to do his appeal to her friend Harry Hopkins, who was an aide to President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Quote, she said. I said, what did you do then? She said, well, I took a boat down to Hyde Park from Saratoga, she told me. That was a vivid memory. That day, going down there by boat and talking to Franklin for all that time that afternoon. He knew what was going on with Jock. He told me, don't worry, I'll get you a lawyer. Franklin was so nice. There are a lot of memories for me up here, some painful quite a bit, but you have to do the best you can do with what you've got left, unquote. So I, I don't have a lot of time left, but as Liz said, you do the best you can with what you've got left. Um, so for me, it's been a vast museum of a thousand rooms haunted by pleasant ghosts that uh, Joe Palmer talked about almost 70 years ago. Two of the most pleasant of all are Rydan and Jiper. Nothing like this could be complete without a bow to the 1962 Travers, to what many people believe was the greatest Travers ever run and one of the greatest races in the history of horse racing. Uh, Rack two-year-old champion the year before, 1961. I remember seeing him run at Arlington Park. He was terrific. Leroy Chuck trained him. And uh, uh, just, just won the Belmont Stakes. They were running for the three-year-old championship up here at Saratoga at the Spa. There was no Breeders' Cup. This was the race that was going to decide who was the three-year-old champion in America. Uh, Jamie, can you play the Travers of 62? They were never more than a half a length apart at one point. And they're off. The Jiper with Rydan along the inside, head head for the lead. Smart moving on the outside, now third. Flying Johnny fourth, Cyan fifth. Military drone sixth, and Cicada is seventh. They go by the stand, Rydan on the rail with Jiper head and head for the lead. A gap of four lengths, that's Smart in third position. Gap of two lengths. From Cyan with Sakata, Flying Johnny, and Military Plume is seven. Swing around the clubhouse turn, Rydan on the inside, with Jiper still heading head for the lead. Gap of five lengths, Cyan moving in the third position. Sakata now full. 
smart fit. Flying Johnny Six, gap of five lengths, and another Terry Plume is last. They go into the back stretch that way. Jiper on the outside and Rye Dan along the rail, still head and head for the lead. Cyang third, Sakata alongside four. Gap of five lengths, Smart is fifth. Flying Johnny six, and Military Plume is last. Going to the half mile pole, it's Rye Dan on the inside in front by a half length with Jiper alongside. Along the rail, Cyang third, Sakata four. Flying Johnny six. Smart six and military plume is seven. At the three eight pole, Jiper moves up right alongside with Rydan still head and head. Along the rail, Cyan now a closer third. Sakata four. Smart is fifth. Flying Johnny six and military plume is seven. Coming into the stretch, that's Jiper out the middle of the track. Cyan along the rail with Rydan. Coming through the stretch now. At Jiper and Rydan still battling for the lead. Military plume on the far side coming on with Smart and Saye. Now turning to the 16th pole, it's Jiper and Rydan still battling head and head. And as they go over the finish line, it's a photograph for the win with <laughs> Jiper. Well, J Jiper won it by a whisker. But they were never more than a half a length apart the entire mile and a quarter. It, it was a remarkable performance by both horses. Jiper eventually was voted three-year-old champion, but uh, I wish it was, to me, a toss-up. Uh, they were both so terrific. Um, uh, any questions at this point? Um, yes. Have you okay? Hello? Does anybody have any questions on anything I said? Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, Sidney's here with me. Um, I can show that to you. I, I was going to talk about that a minute. The time, but I, I'll do it if you'd like me to. Um, Saratoga is known as a graveyard of favorites. And um, uh, ever since the war got beat by uh, upset in the 1919 Sanford State. Am I doing okay? All right. No, I'm sorry. Okay. 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 Um, and of course, uh, Gallon Fox got beat in the 1930 uh, Travers by a horse named Jim Dandy. After the race that Jim Dandy was named, he was a totally unknown horse. I think he was 100 to 1. Um, and then, of course, Secretary got beat by Onion in the Whitney. I want to tell you a story about that. I came up and I was doing the book club, and I had heard some vibes from uh, Frank Tours, the stable guy, that something was wrong with that material. I went over to the barn before the race, about an hour, uh, before the race, watched him get saddled, and I walked over to the, the barn to the cab. And at one point, he got on the turf course, he was walking around the clubhouse, turning the wrong way around the turf course toward the cab. And I would say every
even though he got sick, I thought, well, he's so good he'll be able to overcome against horses that were not in his league. And so they ran a a bunch of talk to my secretary in the Whitney, and here's what happened. Thank you. 